Now we're moving on to a topic that will tremendously impact the global economy and the way all of us approach our daily lives, the future of work. We are very glad that today we are allowed to welcome a globally recognized scholar and ex expert on this highly complex subject here in Vienna. He is driving his research at the esteemed Oxford Martin School at Oxford University, and his expertise is just called upon by various institutions and governments all across the world. <laughs> so we would really like to welcome him on stage, the co-director of the program on technology and employment at the Oxford Martin School. An applause for Dr. Karl Benedikt Frey. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you here today in Vienna and share with you some of the research we are doing at the Oxford Martin School, where we try to understand how advances in digital technology are reshaping the world of work and what that might mean for the future. Unfortunately, I don't have a methodology to see the unseen. I have no way of knowing what is going to happen in the future. But as some of you will have noted, we are today living in an age of automation anxiety with a lot of people fearing that digital technologies, 3D printers, artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, autonomous vehicles, will deprive people of their jobs and leave some of us with less opportunity. And I would like to share with you the insight that we have been here before. Automation anxiety is by no means a recent phenomenon. And when I began looking into this over a decade ago now, what I discovered is that automation is the very last thing that we should worry about. Because Growth was stagnant, as you can see here, for millennia. And something very important happened around 1800. The mechanized factory arrived, displaced the artisan shop, where one worker did nearly every task in production by himself. And this event put us on this self-reinforcing cascade of progress that made us richer and richer and richer, and eventually it created the modern world. Are we at a similar point in history? I think so, and that is great news. What I would like to tell you, though, that unfortunately, that's only half of the story. The early period of industrialization also saw stagnant or even falling wages. It saw declining labor share of income, very much like we have seen since the computer revolution of the 1980s. The early days of industrialization also saw income inequality increase dramatically over the first five to six decades after it began to fall. And in similar fashion, in the age of computerization, in the end of, uh, age of rapid advances in artificial intelligence, we have seen this trend as well. And the reason why we have fared differently during different times of technological progress has very much to do with the fact that there are very different type of technologies. This telescope, for example, didn't replace any workers. It allowed us to glaze at the moons of Jupiter and do previously unimaginable things. It didn't replace workers in existing tasks. The same can be said about computer-aided design software, which allows designers and architects and various skilled professionals to do unconceivable, previously unconceivable things as well. That's very different from a power loom, which replaced handloom weavers, or a robot that replaced workers on the assembly lines. One type of technologies, these enabling technologies, pushes up wages, pushes up employment, pushes up the labor share of income. Replacing technologies have the opposite effect. So for the decades to come, the critical question is really, are we seeing predominantly replacing or enabling technological change? The best thing I can do in answering that question 
It is looking at some of the recent trends we've seen in technology because the computer revolution has not been standing still. If we go back to the early days of computerization, all computers could do was essentially routine rule-based activities where a programmer could specify what the computer should do at every given contingency. In the age of artificial intelligence, top-down programming is no longer required. We can essentially teach computers the way we teach our children. We can simply feed them the data, and they can identify patterns in it. And that's the reason why Google Translate is steadily improving, although it's still far from perfect. It's the reason why autonomous driving is becoming more pervasive. It's the reason why uh, software is becoming better and better in medical diagnostics and document review and a variety of tasks. And when a group of machine learning and mobile robotics experts and I tried to assess the question of what the current boundaries of automation are in this age of artificial intelligence, what we found is that it's actually easier to ask the question the other way around. That being, in which domains do human workers still hold the comparative advantage despite all of these advances in technology? What we find broadly is that human workers still hold the comparative advantage in three domains. One has to do with um, complex social interactions, where I think the best, the state of the art is best described by the Turing test, where chatbots try to convince human judges of them being a person. And some people will suggest to you that there was a breakthrough two years ago when one chatbot actually managed to convince 30% of human judges that they were chatting with a person. But it did so by pretending to be a 13-year-old boy speaking English as a second language. And if you think about the variety of much more complex interactions you do in your daily jobs, we try to persuade people, we negotiate deals, we assist and take care of customers, and so on and so forth. It's almost inconceivable that computers will outperform us in those domains anytime soon. With regards to creativity, there's a big debate in the machine learning community whether computers can be creative or not. And most people that suggest that they can, I believe, are conflating novelty with creativity. I can definitely draw up something novel here on the wall and call myself an artist, but I doubt that any of you would want to buy my artwork. And in the same fashion, the tricky part here is coming up with a combination that makes sense, that appeals to our values. And that is something that um, is very, very hard to automate because we have tremendously deep reservoirs of tacit knowledge which are very hard to, for algorithms to understand and draw upon. Thirdly, um, the last bottleneck to automation relates to the perception and manipulation of irregular objects. And, you know, it's quite straightforward for most of us to just pick up a glass and take a sip of water, right? But the, th the first thing you need to do is, in order to pick up a glass is that you need to identify the object from the background, which is tricky in this case because the glass is transparent. You can see through it. And secondly, you need to apply the right amount of pressure when you pick it up in order not to break it. And presumably, you can do uh, that same task over and over again in you know, any sort of a factory setting. But if you think about the variety of objects you have in your home that you interact with on a daily basis, it's almost inconceivable that we will have something looking like an automated cleaner in the near future. Simple task like, like distinguishing a pot that it's dirty and needs to be clean from a pot that holds a plant. Very intuitive for us, but very hard to automate. So the key question is obviously then, how intensive are jobs that correspond to these engineering um, bottlenecks? What we find is that roughly 47% of jobs in the American context are not very intensive in tasks that um, involve complex social interactions, creativity, and the perception and manipulation of irregular objects. That doesn't mean that all of these jobs are going to disappear anytime soon. 
Decisions to automate depend on a variety of factors, including relative costs between capital and labor. When Nissan produces cars in Japan, it relies heavily on robots. When it does the same thing in India, it relies on heavily on cheap labor. The Google uh, or, or um, autonomous vehicles are not going to operate on your streets unless we give them a driver's license. So legislation plays into the pace of automation as well. And some customers will simply prefer interacting with a person. In Japan, robots are already being applied in elderly care. Where I come from in Sweden, that would still be unthinkable. Um, and the point is not that this somehow is the first time we're seeing jobs being replaced. Few of you will know anybody who works as a lamplighter, an elevator operator, a car washer, a switch or board operator, um, or a longshoreman for that matter. But there can be no doubt that automation has become more pervasive. A key feature of 20th century mechanization was that it created labor release from the farms. And workers with very few skills could actually shift in to factories where they became machine operators and do sort of very simple tasks. And these machines augmented the skills that allowed them to become more productive. But in the age of automation, these machines cannot run on their own. And precisely those type of middle-income jobs that once emerged have now been disappearing across the board. Those with a college education have fared quite well as these middle-skill, middle-income jobs have disappeared and moved up to professional service type of jobs and into tech industries. But many of those who didn't have a college degree have dropped down into low-paid service type of jobs like cleaners, receptionists, gardeners, and so on and so forth, and they have been left worse off by automation. We know from various studies that where robots have been adopted, adopted more extensively, wages and employment has declined. And as I mentioned to you earlier, this is not entirely new. During the first era of industrialization, when the mechanized factory took over a lot of crafts, the jobs of spinners, weavers, and so on disappeared as well. And what was this period of time like? Well, it was not an entirely peaceful period. The mechanized factory ended not just with the construction of the railroads, but also with the publication of the Communist Manifesto. And a lot of people were actually out rioting against machines taking their jobs. Now, I'm definitely not predicting a new wave of machinery riots, but it's important to note that while we in this room have been faring very well from the computer revolution so far, a lot of people hasn't. If you look at the United States, which is the most extreme example, but still it's something that applies to the Western world in general, the wages of those without a college degree have actually fallen in real terms for three consecutive decades. And if you want to understand some of the short-term challenges we're facing now, like the rise of populism, it's very hard to believe that President Trump would be president if there were employment opportunities in abundance for the unskilled and wages were rising for everyone. And if you want to understand why three key, key swing states, being Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, that were firmly in democratic hands every election since 1992, all of a sudden ended up with a Republican candidate, robots is the place to look. Robots, in tandem with globalization, have driven these <coughs> disappearing job opportunities for the unskilled, and as a result of that, they are now opting for more radical populist forces. Looking forward, what are the most common jobs? Well, in nearly every US state, truck drivers are the single biggest occupation. As autonomous vehicles are becoming more pervasive, I find it very likely that this will be one of the first occupations to go. Truck drivers do not require a college degree, and they earn very decent wages, roughly 48,000 in the American context. There are few job opportunities for truck drivers of equal pay that doesn't require a college degree. Now, how do we 
expect these people to respond. The Nobel Prize winning economist Leontief once joked that if horses could join the farms and vote, things may have turned out differently. Now, I'm not sure whether that is true or not, but I find it very striking to see a recent Pew Research survey suggesting that the majority of Americans now believe in restrictions on automation. They would vote for policies that restrict or limit the number of machines that businesses can adopt. And I would like to leave you with this single thought. The Industrial Revolution was the main event of hi in history. It was, was made us infinitely richer over the long run. But a lot of people rioted against it. And one of the reasons it didn't succeed is that the British government actively deployed troops against the rioters. Revolutionary technologies bred a lot of revolutionary pol politicians along the way. And what we need to do is that we, we need to make sure that we manage this transition and make it a shared and prosperous one also in the short run, because in the long run, we're all dead. Thanks very much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much. Okay.